Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 429th episode, I'm going to talk about a cute new ankylosaur. Oh, and I'm going to talk about how maybe baby tyrannosaurs were walking buddies. (laughs) Walking buddies? (laughs) (laughs) That sounds very cute. We also have an interview with Lindsay Kinsella, who is a paleontology enthusiast and also writer of a recent sci-fi novel, which includes dinosaurs. Yeah, lots of cool details about dinosaurs, even though it's a fiction novel. Yeah, I mean, Jurassic Park's also fiction. It's like I sometimes joke that the books we write about dinosaurs are historical fiction. (laughs) (laughs) They're just very long, distant history. A very enjoyable read. (laughs) Yeah. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Magnapolia. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons, and we have nine new patrons to thank this week. Awesome. Yes, and they all helped us reach our 250 patron goal, which again means that we're going to be releasing bonus content to all of our ad-free patrons. We're going to be making extra ad-free episodes. Yes, I feel like we've been talking about this for years, and now we finally (laughs) reached our goal. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) We have literally been talking for it about two to three years. (laughs) So yeah, Triceratops Tearing Up is going to be getting these bonus episodes coming soon. But... Speaking of those patrons that helped us get there, our nine new patrons are Stijakasaurus, RC, Craig, Devin, Riker Tattoo, and Stephanie. And we also have three patrons who upgraded to a shout out tier, and they are Anna Rose, Darren, and Miss Olive. And they said, Miss Olive is my puppy that oddly makes dinosaur like noises, <laughs> and her best friend is a stuffed triceratops named Sarah which I very much enjoyed. Love that. And also Ryan recently upgraded. So thank you all very much for joining and upgrading and then rounding it out because we always thank 10 patrons. Our random drawing winner is Kyle. So thank you very much, Kyle, for also continuing to support us. Yes, thank you all for being part of our community and for growing our community. Yes, definitely. And if you're at one of these ad-free tiers, make sure that you... Get that custom RSS feed into your podcast app if you haven't already. So you get the ad-free episodes, the bonus content, and extended interviews, and then the upcoming new I Know Paleo episodes. Jumping into the news, we've got our new dinosaur, and it is a small ankylosaur. (laughs) So I'm sure you were excited to read about this one. I was. I'm always excited about new ankylosaurs. I like other new dinosaurs too, but ankylosaurs are always my favorite. So this one was published in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology, which is free access. I'm not sure if it's all articles or just this one, but this one specifically definitely is. So if you want to see any pictures, you can see them there. There's a link in our show notes on our website. And it was written by Facundo Righetti and others. It was actually described back in December 2022 as one of those that they snuck in just before the end of the year. December 1st, to be precise. Yeah, and looking at it, they received it December 20th of 2021. Hmm. So it was just under a year it got published after they received it. I'm also pretty sure this is the last dinosaur we have that we need to cover for 2022. So moving on to 2023 (laughs) next. Now that we're in February, (laughs) well into February. (laughs) The researchers didn't just name a new small ankylosaur. They reviewed all of the ankylosaur material from the Allen Formation in northern Patagonia. And Victoria Arbor was included on this paper, too. Nice. It's one of the co I always like to see that because I feel like it adds a lot of weight to whether or not the ankylosaur is going to hold up in the next revision of ankylosaurs. So... This formation is from the Campanian to Maastrichtian, which is roughly 70 million years ago, plus or minus a few million years. That's how it goes in paleo, you know, a few million years here or there. Not a big deal. (laughs) Not when the dinosaurs lasted so long. Yeah. There's a decent number of ankylosaur bones that have been described from the area. They've previously described a bunch of osteoderms and bones from throughout the body, but not much from the head other than a few horns and teeth. So it's not like a super ankylosaur-rich area. In reviewing the bones, they confirmed that some of them were from a new dinosaur, and they named it Patagopelta cristata. Mm. Patagopelta 
you might have guessed, is Patagonia plus Pelta. Patagonia being the area in Argentina where it's from, and Pelta meaning shield, which is a popular end for ankylosaurs because they basically have a giant shield for a back. I'd say the popular end for ankylosaurs is the club tail. <laughs> the literal end. <laughs> Not the end of the name. Yeah. <laughs> Cristata means crest in Latin, and it, quote, refers to the presence of the diagnostic crests on both the anterior surface of the femur and the lateral osteoderm of the cervical rings. So there's a couple important crests on Patagopelta, or specifically Patagopelta cristata. Mm -hmm. If there's another Patagopelta found, maybe they'll get a different species name if they don't get split out into their own genus. There are clues from all over the body that the bones are from a nodosaur, meaning that it doesn't have a tail club. So in this case, it doesn't have that popular end you were talking about with the tail club. Oh. It's just a regular old tail. Well, popular means in a lot, not all. <laughs> it's true. Touche. It doesn't hurt that they found a good number of tail bones to help identify it as a nodosaur. Mm. And the coolest part of the find, I think, is the quote-unquote cervical half ring that I mentioned earlier. Big fans of ankylosaurs may be familiar with that term, but for everyone else, it's the set of fused osteoderms right where the neck meets the body, so sort of at the base of the neck. Cervical means neck, and then it's a half ring because it's basically osteoderms that cover the top and the sides of the body. So if you imagine like a C-shaped piece of armor over the neck. Yeah, it probably would have been uncomfortable to have armor on the underside. Yeah, and I we don't really know exactly how they behaved, but there have been some hypotheses that maybe they sort of dug down a little bit like an armadillo <laughs> and like half buried their fleshy underside in the dirt. And so if that's the case, they don't they wouldn't need the armor on the bottom. And you need somewhere to be flexible. You can't have your entire body being rigid. Mm -hmm. I guess turtles kind of do, but then they have a really flexible head that they can like suck into their shell. Anyway, <laughs> I think that if you're thinking about the cervical half ring, it's kind of like a metal collar that a knight would wear. It's like a, a big protection piece of one of the most vulnerable parts of the body. The cervical half ring also has some unique features that warranted naming a new genus and species, like I mentioned that cristata piece. Specifically, the osteoderms on the sides have a higher crest than usual. In other words, they're basically spikier, hmm. is how you could think of it. So there's maybe a more exciting necklace or collar this ankylosaur has <laughs> than its relatives. The femur also has that strongly developed muscular crest on the front side. We don't know exactly what that's about. Maybe it pulled its leg up and forward in a different way than other nodosaurs because that's the side of the femur that the muscle attachment point is on. Usually bones get pulled in the direction of the the projection where the muscle attachment is. Not always. There can be fancy things that go on. Like with birds, they have a crest on one side of their arm and a muscle that's on the same side and it has like a pulley that goes over the arm and does fancy things. You could have interesting stuff, but it probably means that it was lifting that leg forward in a different way somehow. Or it's just some weird feature that it held onto from some other lineage and just never lost. Hard to say. They also found the quadratojugal horn of Patagopelta. And the quadratojugal is from the back of the head. They also found a tooth and vertebrae from the back and tail, as well as a whole bunch of other osteoderms in addition to that cervical half ring. Anytime you have an ankylosaur, it's nice when osteoderms are found with it. Yeah, I was kind of surprised. So they didn't find a skull other than just that one quadratojugal horn. Mm -hmm. It's a hard word to say, quadratojugal. And I know Victoria Arbor, the way that she tends to classify ankylosaurs is based on the different skull ornamentation. Mm -hmm. And so I guess this quadratojugal and then that cervical half ring and the femur were enough to convince her that it was a new genus. But I'm a little bit surprised because a lot of times we just have so few bones from the bodies of ankylosaurs that it's really hard to compare to other ankylosaurs and say like, yeah, this is a new one. It might be partly that there just wasn't a lot of stuff in this area that we've named. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, we could name it based on these features, even though most ankylosaurs we name based on more of the stuff in the head. That's my guess. 
Patagopelta was pretty small for an ankylosaur. They estimate it was about 2.2 meters or seven feet long, which is small <laughs> for an ankylosaur. Tiny thing. Well, ankylosaurus, I forget exactly what the latest estimate is, but I think it's in the 20 to 30 foot range. Yeah, it's much bigger. And the longer you get to, they get much wider. So this thing w- wouldn't have been all that wide either. And it makes you wonder, too, it didn't even have a club on its tail. So how was it defending itself? Maybe it was burrowing. Yeah, that's that's my best guess. I love that hypothesis because it's like it couldn't run fast. It wasn't that armored. It didn't have any tail weaponry. It probably wasn't that smart, unfortunately. Mm. And yeah, I don't know. I hope it could dig down or do something. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure if this is a juvenile or an adult either. Right. So it's possible maybe it would have gotten a little bit bigger. But the authors do recognize it as a small ankylosaur and make reference to dwarf notosaurids. So I think that they believe that it's reasonable that this might have been an adult. They compare it to the dwarf notosaurid Struthiosaurus, which has been estimated at two to three meters long. So right in the same ballpark. Struthiosaurus is a really weird name for an ankylosaur since there's not much ostrich-like about it. (laughs) That's a good point. (laughs) Where the struthio part means ostrich. It's like ostrich dinosaur is the name, basically. Ankylosaurs are kind of the opposite of ostriches. (laughs) Virtually every way. Ostriches have long legs. They have short legs. Ostriches are fast. Ankylosaurs are slow. Ostriches have like fluffy feathers and no real defenses other than running. Ankylosaurs are like hunker down and defend themselves. It's like it couldn't be any less (laughs) (laughs) ostrich-like. Except apparently the back of the skull of Struthiosaurus looked somewhat similar to an ostrich. Hmm. And props to Bunzel for noticing that when he named it way back in 1871. This is another case of one of those dinosaurs are birds being noticed way back in the 19th century Mm -hmm. without really putting it together. The story sounds pretty interesting. And if any patrons are looking for a Dinosaur of the Day request. Oh, that's a hint. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not allowed to give Dinosaur of the Day requests. (laughs) Someone else has to do it. (laughs) But if Struthiosaurus sounds familiar, it's probably because there was a study on its hearing last year that we talked about where they found that basically it had really bad hearing or as Fizz.org put it, quote, ankylosaurus was sluggish and deaf, end quote. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I talked about it in our fun fact in episode 377, and they estimated that Struthiosaurus could hear about 300 hertz to 2160 hertz, which means they couldn't hear below middle C on a piano and couldn't hear the top six keys of the piano at all. Or put another way, they basically had the same hearing range as a flute. It's not bad. But like, I couldn't imagine listening to a concert and only hearing the flute and other instruments in that sound range. Like you'd be missing like all the low brass mm-hmm. and all the higher pitch sounds. It would be sad. I love music. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they don't know what they're missing, though. Fortunately for Patagopelta, it wasn't a close relative of Struthiosaurus, so it might have been able to hear a little better. Maybe not. We didn't find the inner ear, so we can't do any estimates. Pretty speculative, yeah. Yeah. Patagopelta's closest relatives are mid-Cretaceous North American notosaurines, which is surprising since previously the Patagonian ankylosaurs were thought to be closer relatives to much later notosaurids, but still ones from North America. So we thought we know at some point these ankylosaurs went from North America down to South America, and it looks like in this case they might have come down a little bit earlier because they were related to the mid-Cretaceous stuff rather than the later notosaurids. As to why Struthiosaurus and Patagopelta are so small. Island dwarfs. Yes, exactly. Struthiosaurus lived on Hatag Island, so it may have been an island dwarf. That's a simple one. Patagopelta may have also been an island dwarf. But different island. Yes, very far away island. Because in the late Cretaceous, the Kawa Sea covered part of South America, including Patagonia from the Atlantic side. It sort of invaded over. And northern Patagonia had some islands, possibly including where Patagopelta lived. Or another possibility is its ancestors lived there. And so it evolved to be the smaller form. As an interesting side note, they briefly talked about other Gondwan and ankylosaurs and their validity. They mentioned that Antarctopelta and Minmi were considered nomina dubia. Really? AKA not valid dinosaurs. Yeah, I think we might have talked about this a while ago. Victoria Arbor did like a review of ankylosaurs. Yeah. But I like, <laughs> remember Minmi, didn't remember Antarctic Pelta. 
Yeah, because Minmi, basically, there's Kumbarasaurus, which got named, it got like split out from Minmi, but then it turned out that the one named Minmi that wasn't split didn't have enough diagnostic features, so then Kumbarasaurus became the only one, even though it was named later. It's sort of strange how that worked out. And then Antarctopelt is a similar story. They didn't think it had enough unique features, but it's really unfortunate because we talk about Ant- Antarctopelt a lot. So I guess in that case, it's not a specific ankylosaur. In that case, it's almost like a nickname for a dinosaur at that point. You could think of it sort of like Sue the T-Rex. Like it's a name of a dinosaur, but it's not a name that scientists would use as a genus at this point, I guess. But they also looked at Spicomelus and Stegouros, and they seem to have reaffirmed them as valid taxa, which oh, I found very interesting. Good. You love Stegouros. I do love Stegouros. It's very cool. And at first, when I saw them mention Spicomelus, I thought that they were saying maybe that one might not be valid because they were saying more research needs to be done on it. But I think what they were actually saying is that we need to research where in the ankylosaur family tree it fits. And that one's really crazy. That's that rib looking thing that has spikes sticking out of it. Yeah. Like the most metal dinosaur ever. Like it literally <laughs> has spikes growing out of its ribs. I don't think any other dinosaur has that that we found. We've never found any animal period that has that. It's totally crazy. And I wouldn't be too surprised if it ended up not being an ankylosaur at the end of the day. But the ribs of ankylosaurs are pretty unique in their flatness. And Spicomelus seems to have that. So probably an ankylosaur. A super cool one. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) I've talked about a lot of other ankylosaurs, but the new one is Patagopelta. It's very cool. It's a little 2.2 meter, seven foot long notosaurid from Patagonia, probably an island. Very nice. Speaking of cute dinosaurs, so like I mentioned, there's a paper that hypothesizes that baby tyrannosaurs may have been walking friends. <laughs> like walking friends with each other or walking friends of other dinosaurs like land before time? With each other. Okay. I think in the sequels, wasn't there a group of tyrannosaurs, like a baby tyrannosaur? I think there was just one, okay. Chomper. Yeah. So Chomper was friends and was walking buddies. Yeah, but they were really worried about when Chomper grew up. <laughs> As they should be. <laughs> Anyway, this paper, I like the title. It's a busy time at the beach. Multiple examples of gregarious dinosaur behavior. It was published in Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences by Donald Henderson and others. And they found a lot of dinosaur tracks and trackways that were preserved in a way that could mean the tracks were made in just a few days or less, Hmm. which is cool. I don't think we often hear when we're talking about tracks how long it took to make those tracks. Yeah, it's that's always a hard thing to nail down because it's hard to prove that a track was made and then another dinosaur was there at the same time or if that track just sat there and then another dinosaur stepped there. Like, they're not time-stamped. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I guess there's tricks you can do. Sometimes they talk about if they're overlapping. So if they if one track's laid down and then there's another track that sort of deforms it a little bit. So it seems like they probably happened in quick succession. That can be one way. There's probably other tricks too. Well, in this case, what's also cool is that they found a lot of animals. So there were, in addition to the tyrannosaurs, there's medium and large ornithomimids, small and medium-sized ornithopods, a small hadrosaurid, and as they put it, inferred hatchling tyrannosaurids. Inferred hatchling tyrannosaurids. Hmm. They had pointed claw tips. So they said it it could be a tyrannosaurid or at least some sort of carnivore. I see. Yeah. They're thinking it's a theropod track. And then based on the dinosaurs that are from that area, the most likely one is a tyrannosaurid. And since they're tiny, then they're hatchling sized. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So there's seven trackways thought to be made by these hatchling tyrannosaurids. In six of them, the tracks go in the same direction in equally spaced pairs. I see. Those are the buddies. Yeah. And then one pair of tracks, they're in the opposite direction, but they're parallel to the other two pairs. Gotcha. So they're literally buddies, like Mm -hmm. pairs of buddies. Yeah, walking together. (laughs) It seems they walked in pairs. So maybe they were in groups when they were young. Hmm. It's, I mean, of course, it's, it's hard to know for sure based on tracks. Yeah, you wonder, like, how are those groups made? Mm-hmm. Were they all from the same clutch? Maybe there's roughly two from each clutch, and those are just, <laughs> like, the siblings walking together. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's fun to think about. The ornithomimid tracks also seem to show two animals walking together. They're going at the same speed, the same direction. They even turn together. Hmm. And those are thought to come from a medium-sized bipedal dinosaur. They said possibly Parxosaurus warrenii. Wow, that's specific. They were not shy about throwing out very specific guesses for these track makers. (laughs) (laughs) The tracks are about 72 million years old, and they were found in the St. Mary River Formation in what is now Alberta, Canada. So, busy time at the beach indeed. Hmm, it was a beachy environment? I think so. Nice. And in just a moment, we're going to go on to our interview with Lindsay Kinsella. But first, we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. And now we're going to go on to our interview. And a quick reminder for our patrons, there is an extended version of this interview in your premium content feed. So if you'd rather listen to the extended version, you might want to switch over to that and listen to the extended version. We are joined this week by Lindsay Kinsella, a paleontology enthusiast and writer and author of the sci-fi novel, The Lazarus Taxa, which includes scientists time traveling to the late Cretaceous. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to geek out about dinosaurs a little. (laughs) Yeah. I wanted to ask before we geek out about dinosaurs, I saw in your bio that you're also a naval architect. That's right. Yeah. Which is tends to be quite a difficult one to explain what I actually do. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's effectively engineering. I, I work in kind of ship design. That's really interesting and super cool. So we really enjoyed your book and it is very clear you know your dinosaurs. You know your paleontology because there's stuff from even before the dinosaurs in there. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. I suppose this was really a bit of a test of that, because if anyone was going to poke any holes in it, it would have been you to do it. Um, Yeah, there there was, there's there's sort of, I I think, a kind of lifetime of, you know, enthusiasm underlying all that, but then a certain amount of kind of intensive research for the book itself. I'm used to doing sort of podcasts for, you know, writing podcasts or, or literature podcasts and they always ask you know how long did you spend researching this book and I'm always like well since I was about seven (laughs) um, I I just didn't realize that's what I was doing (laughs) (laughs) that's good yeah and it's I loved all the like maybe you could call them easter eggs that were in there like one of your characters it's Diane Buckland is that a nod to William Buckland Yes, (laughs) Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I have to say, you you are the first person to pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Buckland is really important in dinosaur history, but I mean, he was like before cameras and all that stuff and before dinosaurs got really popular. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't think a lot of people know about Buckland. Yeah, well, I, I like to, um, I, I made a point of not doing any direct reference to any Living paleontologist for fear of, <laughs> you know, lawsuits, but <laughs> made, made sure anyone I referenced was long dead. Oh, although you do have Sid reading the dinosaur heresies and you've got a Bob Barker quote in the beginning, so. Oh, bugger. Yeah, so I do. Okay, let's hope Bob doesn't sue me. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. He seems cool. Yeah. 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 And it's all in a favorable light. <laughs> I don't know if I hope he does or hope he doesn't listen to your podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> there was also, uh, for our listeners, uh, it is possible we might get into some spoilers because I really want to ask some in-depth dinosaur stuff, which I think you kind of can't get away from some of the spoilers that way, but unfortunately. but <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, I think that's inevitable. <laughs> there's, uh, at the end, I wanted to ask, there's like this thin... Albertosaurus, and you've got this description. You can see its ribs and its skin with its cuts and burns. Was that, by any chance, any inspiration taken from Big Al? If there was, I think it was probably subconscious. <laughs> I think that really, that really stemmed more from a sort of frustration with with the way, particularly large theropods are portrayed in the media, of just being sort of mindless eating machines. Mm-hmm. But equally, if you're writing sort of sci-fi fiction you can't have them just you know hugging people <laughs> so I, I i really wanted to show this as an animal that had, had a hard time 
you know, it had been sort of captured. It hadn't been treated particularly well. Sort of like a, you know, sort of like a, a kind of abused dog type scenario. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted to, to justify its behavior rather than just it, it be inherently mindless. Mm. Yeah. There were a number of dinosaurs that we find out later were mistreated and it was really interesting to see how they acted and appeared and the different ways they connected or acted around people. So like the Dakota Raptor, for example, I thought was, yeah, just really interesting. Yeah, I wanted to take the approach with at least a number of, of them. And I think the Dakota Raptor was the most obvious of those where I, I sort of treat it almost as a character in its own right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I kind of thought to myself, you know, what's what are its motivations? You know, what's its sort of backstory? And I, I suppose in a lot of ways it even has a sort of character arc. And I, I think I wanted to do something where we, we sort of make the reader sympathise with that particular animal and see it as more than just a monster. And, and sure, I suppose that it can be both because I, I think... When you, when you think of a lot of modern predators, if you were in a room with a tiger, I'm, I'm sure it, it would seem like a monster to you. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that's how it is all the time. It's, it's still it's still a, a, an animal with feelings and fears, and I, I wanted to try and bring that across as best I could and, and make it seem real. Definitely, yeah. Like There's a range of emotions it can go through. And also, well, with all of the dinosaurs too, like the level of intelligence especially with the raptors. Like, we know these were intelligent animals, and then we got to see that in your book. Yeah, I think with the probable exception of the Ankylosaurus, which I very much made a point to show that it was quite stupid. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Ankylosaurus. Oh, we know, Garrett. But I mean, that is the thing in general, right? The predators tend to be smarter because their job is more complicated than just, like, bending over and chewing. (laughs) Well, that's that's uh, you know what's what's basically a, a big armored cow doesn't mm-hmm. need a whole lot of problem solving skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, kind of going back to to showing the different facets or the different aspects of the dinosaurs. There's a lot of herbivores in your story where we see them getting protective and defensive, and they can be just as vicious and dangerous, which we don't always see in in other media. Yeah. We talk about that all the time, like the most dangerous animal, technically large animal in Africa is the hippo, but everybody thinks of lions and, you know, hyenas and things like that. Yeah, I I think that's something that I wanted to sort of counter. It's something you see in a lot of dinosaur media. I mean, obviously something like, you know, Jurassic Park is is an obvious example of, I think, what's become known as the friendly herbivore trope, (laughs) where there, there seems to be this sort of understanding with modern animals that things like bulls and hippos and and bison are dangerous. But when we talk about extinct animals, the only possible motivation they could have for attacking us would be to eat us. Mm -hmm. So I I wanted to try and combat that and show that, you know, a three-ton herbivore um, wouldn't wouldn't be something that you would want to hang out with either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, they all laid eggs, so... That alone is something worth defending for every one of them, regardless of how big or small or what they ate. Well, that's that's it, and I, and I think in a lot of ways, I mean, a, a an animal which is used to being preyed upon is, if anything, likely to be much more defensive than a predator. So I really wanted to show that, and I wanted to make sure that some of the the old tropes that we see were actively dispelled, mm-hmm. um, whatever I could really. Well, yeah, because on the other side. All of the carnivores, they're quiet and they stalk their prey and they're very stealthy. Mm-hmm. And there's not a lot of... Uh, Screaming I'm... right before they attack? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I really wanted to remove the, the famous Tyrannosaurus roar because that's a pet peeve of mine. It really is. <laughs> and it's in all dinosaur media. They always come running at you, screaming to let you know where they are. Yeah. Yeah. No, no predator does that. There might be a couple scenes in Jurassic Park where it makes sense, where it's like looking at a car and it's like, what is this thing? Go away. You know, it's like yeah. screaming at it kind of thing. But yeah, when it's like a raptor, like mid pounce starts screaming, you're like, why would an animal ever no. do that? It, it's more like in the Lazarus tax, it's all of a sudden they turn around and oh, there's the <laughs> predator that they didn't know was there at all. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might have heard something. Oh, no. <laughs> 
and and I sort of wanted to I kind of thought you know what would it actually be like to be you know stalked by some sort of predator and I, I did a little research on that front where I would I would find kind of interviews with people who had survived you know animal attacks and they all said much the same thing to start with is that they didn't see it coming mm-hmm. and I thought, mm-hmm. that's probably how it should be in you know fiction too yeah that's true yeah because if you see it coming you're going to turn around and run away. <laughs> yes. Although you might not be able to outrun all of them. <laughs> <laughs> or find a way to fight back, or at least just make it harder on them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah was, that was something that was quite interesting to do with the Tyrannosaurus in particular, because it's, it is, I always thought it's been quite interesting. We, we hear, you know, over the past maybe 10 or 20 years, questions over, you know, how fast could it run? And, and the, sort of consensus these days is that not very fast mm-hmm. is the answer, which means it must have been an ambush predator. So I've, I've always been really fascinated with this notion that this enormous animal <laughs> could hide itself well enough to ambush anything. Yeah. So I, yeah. I believe that there's, I'm, I'm cautious of not going too spoilery here, but you'll probably know the scene I speak of where, you know, that it, it very much makes the most of that stealth capability that it has and it and it just appears from nowhere. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think that's that's far scarier than something which comes tearing across a field um roaring at you. Yeah, very true. Yeah. That was we talk about it sometimes on the our podcast too, where we're talking about Jurassic Park movies and the differences between them and everything. And we often talk about how the first movie was more of a horror movie and you didn't actually see the dinosaurs that much. Mm -hmm. But you feel when you remember the movie, you feel like the dinosaurs are there the whole time. Right. Because you're constantly wondering, like, where is the dinosaur? Like, I know it's lurking around here somewhere, just quietly moving around in the background. (laughs) And that's what we get in the Lazarus text, too, especially in the the end there. Um, Yeah, it felt very much like it turned to a horror. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There, there were definitely some horror elements, which I think um, I've, I've sort of considered in recent times for future novels, just writing some outright horror, because I really quite <laughs> enjoyed writing those scenes. I think that probably makes me some kind of sadist. And I probably <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't tell a psychiatrist that, but <laughs> yeah, so this, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, going back to T-Rex... It, this kind of applies to the other dinosaurs too, is because there's some really vivid descriptions, really enjoyable to read descriptions. But obviously, we have to kind of, I mean, the science only takes us so far, and then you kind of have to fill in the blanks. So, with T Rex, like the honking sounds or the different sounds it made, uh, the hissing and the honking and stuff like that is really interesting. Yeah, I think with that, I, I could have went a number of directions with the noises it made. I, I, I was absolutely convinced that I didn't want it to roar. I didn't want to make any sort of, any sounds that could be considered sort of mammalian, which mm-hmm. seems to be the way a lot of them go. But that left me with a lot of options of, of what, what to do. And I thought, why not just lean into the bird side of things? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I thought it was both kind of funny. There was a little bit of comic relief in there. But but also a demonstration that we really don't know, and it could have sounded like anything. So the fact that this giant tyrannosaur honked like a goose, kind of <laughs> made me but, you know, um, we'd have to. I mean, that kind of comes after a really sort of tense scene with the animal, and, yeah. and then it kind of breaks the tension when it when it starts honking, and they realise that that's the sort of goose noise that they've been hearing through the forest all the all the time. Yep, yeah, it's been there the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I also liked, uh, yeah, there's there's certain papers that are still up for debate, mm-hmm. and I liked that you acknowledged them. So, like, a T-Rex was described as having lips. You mentioned Taurosaurus, but then it also quickly is like, oh, but, you know, it might just be Triceratops. <laughs> and Pachycephalosaurus, Wyomingensis, but that used to be known as Draco Rex. So, yeah, all these, like, little details that are kind of thrown in there. Yeah, I think... Um... A lot of it just stems from sheer geekiness, if I'm <laughs> honest. I just <laughs> really want to improve it. I think with some, I mean, I think the lips is a good example of where I could have went one way or another with the sort of creature design, if you like. And where I had that option, I made sure to go the opposite way from sort of traditional 
tiny sort of fiction. So I could have went with lips, I could have went without lips. The this science isn't really agreed either way. And I thought, well, usually we see them without. So I thought it just made it more interesting. And sometimes with the likes of Draco Rex, I just thought it was a cooler name. <laughs> 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 that translates to Dragon King, and that would be a cool chapter name. Mm-hmm. That is a cool name. But I, th- I think those kind of tidbits of, of information were kind of interesting for people, and I think that was part of the, the purpose of the book in a lot of ways, was to try and bring some of the really interesting little quirky details of paleontology that probably most people aren't really aware of, just try and bring them to people. Yeah, <laughs> I think it will be interesting to see which of the sort of creature designs or, or which of the, the animal behaviours is the first to fall, you know, which which is the first that a paper is released and may go, ah, bugger, well, that's how they do now. <laughs> I think you can, well, you could probably put a disclaimer. This was accurate as of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's like when we were talking to the people who developed, oh, what was the game? Saurian. And they were talking about how they they created the Hell Creek ecosystem, and then they totally redid their T-Rex after a bunch of papers came out because they're like, oh, it definitely had feathers. So we got to like do all this stuff to have feathers. And then after they did that, another paper came out and it was like, no, it definitely didn't have feathers. And then they were like, <laughs> okay, we're just going to have to eventually say this is accurate to this point in time. It's a snapshot of what we thought the science was like and just go on with our lives because otherwise we'll just spend our entire life you know, like updating little details of the appearance of these dinosaurs in this game that aren't really you know super impactful on the gameplay or anything like that so yeah i think the same is true about your book right because it's like these animals are acting in a specific way and you're using certain traits of the dinosaurs to affect what sort of role they can play in the book and so they're important to that extent. But if there's a subtle difference in like, oh, it didn't have this thing on its neck or it had more feathers here or there, it's like, okay, but it still can be a good book for the time without being 100% accurate to like 2050 dinosaur science. <laughs> yeah, I think, that's, I think that's true. And I, I think what was more important than it necessarily being strictly accurate, well, I did, you know, it, that was important to me too. I think what was more important was that it didn't, reinforce old stereotypes mm-hmm. so i wanted to make sure that any areas that, that maybe weren't entirely accurate were at least inventive you know it could be wrong but it had to be wrong in new ways <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to repeat mistakes if you're going to make mistakes they're going to be new mistakes <laughs> <laughs> exactly if i'm if i'm going to get my homework wrong i want to get it wrong on my own and not copy yeah. someone else's wrong homework <laughs> there you go <laughs> <laughs> so going back a bit, I did really enjoy the chapters. I don't would you call it chapter the chapters that are kind of in between the chapters of the story that explain more of the science, but then it also kind of foreshadows or it's linked to what's going on with the characters. Yeah, those were I, th- I think both both really interesting to write and also very difficult to write because I I had a lot of information to sort of fit into those, but without making it seem like an info dump, you know, Mm -hmm. and and try and make it seem relevant to the story and and not just a complete left turn out of nowhere. But I think they were quite important for, you know, like I said, was the purpose of the book was to try and show people that there's more to paleontology than just what they've seen in movies. So, yeah, and I think particularly things like that there's a... There's a, there's a chapter which goes through the sort of last day of the Cretaceous with mm-hmm. you know, the asteroid impact. And I think that's it's not even really related to the story other than the last paragraph or two. I think that was one of my favourite chapters to write because you could just really bring it to life and show us a bit more than just, you know, a big rock comes and there's a big explosion. Yeah. yeah. You know, show us so much more than that. Show just how really was Armageddon. Mm-hmm. Yeah the ground turned to liquids, you know, molten glass raining from the sky, you know, really quite a horrific picture, I suppose. But fascinating too, I've always thought. Yeah, Colorado is a really good distance to be describing that from too, because I remember we were, I was figuring out one day doing the math on, or maybe I think I put it into a model that could model impacts and distances. So I was like, okay, where we are, how far from Chicxulub we are, what would it be like here? And it was a pretty good spot in terms of getting all of the 
catastrophe <laughs> because yeah, you, if you, you were, were instantly vaporized exactly you got, to, you got to suffer for a little while yeah <laughs> if you're too close it's got like to. <laughs> yeah it's, it's not exciting right it's just vaporized and whatever and if you're a little bit farther out it's like okay well you just get killed by the shockwave but if you're in that sweet spot where it's not so far away that it's just sort of a distant thing and some tsunamis it's like, okay, you get the raining glass like you were talking about. You get the huge burst of air, the widespread forest fires, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, and then the nuclear winter at the end of it from the ash. And so, yeah, it was just that thing where it's like, okay, well, this part would be good if you were underground because you wouldn't have gotten burst into flames, but then the floods come. So then you want to be on top of the ground. And, you know, in the beginning, it would be good to be a predator because you could scavenge the food from all the other stuff dying, but then it would be worse later because there aren't any plants and it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those, those Mexican dinosaurs got it too easy. Yeah, exactly. Because they're just, you know, they're, <laughs> they're gone. one and done. Oh. One, one what, thing I do wish I'd that, that um, the, the book predates the publication of the, the paper on, on Tannis. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would have loved within that chapter to have included some some details about the Tanis. I think that would have been fascinating. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. The mass extinctions are just one of the most evocative things because you, you have the time leading up to it where, you know, we as the reader know that everything, even 68 million years ago, to us, mm-hmm. that seems like, uh-oh, you know, they're getting kind of close to that, even right. though none of those animals had to worry about it. Right. We still know. Yeah. Well, even Sid mentions at one point, it's like, oh, do we have to worry about this? Like, no, it's two million years away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, think, like, I think there was a throwaway line, like, I, I, I hope we're home by then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like 200 <laughs> times all of human history <laughs> away from it. <laughs> I think it was sort of a nice way of putting the, the time into perspective as well, which is something I tried to do a few times throughout the book, because I think that's one of the things that people, myself included, struggle with the most when we talk about paleontology, is that you just can't wrap your head around how long you know, millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years actually is. It just mm-hmm. It just becomes a... A, a sort of abstract number so trying to put that in context was, was kind of interesting to do at times as well and that was one way to do it you know two million years before the extinction doesn't sound a lot in the grand scheme of things but it is yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're going about your day-to-day life like do i have to worry about an asteroid today no you, you do not <laughs> 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 Just have to put it in your two million year look ahead calendar. Yeah. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> I definitely need to ask about Lazarus, the Leptoceratops, and kind of the namesake of the book. He sounds really cute. Yeah. I wanted a dinosaur for that that most people hadn't heard of. I wanted something new, something interesting, not just the usual. And yeah, Leptoceratops is just so weird. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but also kind of cute in a really strange dog lizard kind of way. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I think that I maybe, maybe exaggerated things like Lazarus's intelligence, maybe <laughs> slightly unrealistically in, in an effort to make him kind of lovable, I suppose. But yeah, I wanted, I, I wanted a, a dinosaur that wasn't a monster. That, yeah. That wasn't directly a threat something that was just kind of al- almost a pet I mean by the end I suppose it, it kind of is I mean it, it, again try not to spoil things but I suppose in the end it, sure, it, it but looked, yeah you know it looked, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he was sort of interesting to write yeah you've got this one line like yeah he does definitely seems pet like like a good pet and I like that because we've talked about it on our show too, like, oh, which dinosaur would make a good pet? And Leptoceratops, I think, falls under that. With Sabrina, every time it's a small sauropod, she's like, could I have that as a pet? Like, it's still like 20 <laughs> feet long. It's not that small. Yeah. But yeah, Leptoceratops. So small... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like you were saying, so uh, with Lazarus, though, he still has these interesting features. And I really liked your description with the powerful beak, how it could slice through I think he said a turnip like a chocolate sponge. <laughs> like, yeah. What a great image. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's something, I mean, I, I don't know when I plan to write a follow-up, to be honest. I, I kind of, I like to, I like to go away and do different projects before thinking about any sort of sequel. But I, I would like to explore, even just in a sort of comedic fashion, 
what is it like to train a leptoceratops to, to live? You know, how, how is it? How is it to toilet train? And how? And I sort of alluded to it in the end. You know, it mm-hmm. sort of keeps eating the house plants and you know things like that. You know, <laughs> how how do you learn to live with an animal? Because you can't Google it. You know, if no. you're having trouble training your dog, there are plenty of places online where you can just kind of. No, my dog does this. How do I stop? <laughs> yeah. um, but the, the idea of trying to train an animal which has never been trained and probably doesn't want to be trained um, mm-hmm. has some some comedy value. So I might, I might include that. <laughs> yeah, those fierce. It's interesting, like we were talking about with the difference between you know the way herbivores and carnivores are portrayed. Something with those types of shearing beak with all that force behind it isn't something that we've ever tried to domesticate. You know, Mm -hmm. we don't have anything with jaws quite like that. And you could imagine it just like getting frustrated with you and just like biting off a finger really easily. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the the closest thing I could think of was was something like a snapping turtle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something with this really powerful reptilian beak. And I thought, oh, that that would do you some damage. (laughs) And a lot of the tops is considerably larger than even the biggest snapping turtle. Yeah, yeah. It seemed inevitable that that beak would be not something you wanted to have your hand in anyway. Yeah. Yeah, there'd probably be like a controversy over it. Like some people would be doing something to the beak to make it less menacing. And then there'd be a different group of people like, oh, no, that's not humane. You can't do that. I leave my leptoceratops with its peak of sharp <laughs> beakness. <laughs> <laughs> Things, I'm, I'm not even sure there's much you could do about that. I mean, you can blunt it all you want, but I think... It, those those kind of beaks work on just force. Yeah, I that's mean, true. The sheer bite force on something like that must have been enormous. Yeah, yeah, it's like a scissor. It doesn't need to be sharp. It's just the, that shearing force will just go through whatever. Yeah, and it's something I, I don't even think there's any sort of studies on that. We hear a lot about bite force analysis of you know giant carnivores. Mm-hmm. But there's a, but I bet a you some of those things could could take a finger off. Yeah, I'm sure. We did an interview with Ali Nabavizada a long time ago, and he was looking at how perhaps the frills of ceratopsians had muscle attachment going up at least part way, and so that would yeah. give them like that added muscle there for like the really strong bite. And they already had very deep skulls, mm-hmm. you know, almost like the herbivorous version of a T-Rex with that much deeper skull than a lot of the other dinosaurs. Yeah. So yeah, it would have definitely been able to bite very strong <laughs> and yeah it would make domestication a challenge for sure mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. so uh, what are you working on next At the moment i have a, a more of a sort of fantasy novel which is hopefully going to be off to the editors shortly um mm-hmm. I've, I've stuck with the sort of subject material it's it's still quite dinosaur heavy but i wanted to do it in a, a slightly more family friendly way because that was in a lot of ways the original intention of the Lazarus Taxa was write a book about dinosaurs, people can learn about dinosaurs, whether it's, you know, adults or children. And then what I wrote was a rather violent, horror filled <laughs> book and does get a little graphic, <laughs> yes. <laughs> got away from me a little, I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you just started torturing the the characters and you're like how much more can i torture them and before you know it it's not family friendly <laughs> and i'm not sure at which point in the writing process i realized that it was no longer child friendly <laughs> fairly early on i think so i think really with with my next book i thought well i need to kind of rectify that and i've, I've got older kids as well i have a, a son who's 10 and a daughter who's six and I thought I would quite like to write something that that they could read without you know getting nightmares Mm because I'm the one who has to get up when they have nightmares (laughs) so it's just (laughs) purely selfish reasons (laughs) and you've got uh uh beta readers built in (laughs) oh true yeah, that's true. That's true. I could have got them to beta read the Lazarus taxa, and just every time they scream, that's a that's a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this this new book is is more of a sort of fantasy setting. I thought that's a that's a, a good way to include all those sort of animals, but without the kind of inherent violence, I guess, that comes with dealing with real giant reptiles. Mm. Because I think that's the thing with the Lazarus Act, so that sort of became inevitable. Mm-hmm. You couldn't have a book grounded firmly on reality 
with dinosaurs and never have anyone get hurt. It yeah. just yeah. didn't work. Um, what else is the book going to be about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I thought I'd explore a more kind of fantasy setting. And it's, it's, it's a young girl who kind of like, I suppose like I was as a child, and I guess like a lot of us were sort of dinosaur obsessed. Mm-hmm. And she kind of finds herself creating this world within her own subconscious because it's a sort of imaginary world, you can get away without bloody violence and, you know, people losing limbs and that kind of thing. It's, it's not necessary in that setting. So, yeah, it's kind of more quirky, kind of fun. I think some of the comedy aspects from the Lazarus Taxa, which were probably more secondary to the rest of the story, they're, they're kind of brought forward in this book. And it's, it's fun and kind of more more emotion driven than than just pure fear mm-hmm. nice that sounds good yeah you have to let us know when that one's out I, I had hoped it would be out by now but i had always kind of said to myself that there's no deadline mm-hmm. it's released when it's ready kind of thing and it, it's not quite so hopefully hopefully <laughs> yeah. i might be saying that in another year ah, it's not quite ready <laughs> 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 Well, for our listeners who want to follow along and stay up to date on your work, where's the best place to find out more about you and your books online? So the best place for me is probably on Facebook. That's where I have the, the sort of main following. My page is just Lindsay Kinsella, colon, the Lazarus Taxa. But for those who don't use it, I'm also on Twitter, Instagram. I do have a TikTok. I haven't quite plucked up the courage to film any TikToks yet, but... <laughs> I feel too old for that, if I'm honest. But I'm... <laughs> your kids can teach you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll get some tutorials. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to seeing your next book. Yes, and then for our listeners, we definitely recommend the Lazarus Tax. It's got, in addition to all the awesome dinosaur stuff, it's it's a great story to read with a lot of twists and turns, and also those horror elements. Just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much, you two. It's, it's been it's been amazing to be on. Um, I'm glad I, I managed to blag my way on here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been great fun, and to be quite honest, I'm sick about talking about you know character development and plot devices. I wanted to talk about dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, I think we barely talked about the characters. <laughs> yeah. You got a couple that's, names. That's, yeah. that's why I'm here. <laughs> Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much again for joining us. You're you're quite welcome, and and thank you. It's been fun. Thanks again, Lindsay, for the fantastic interview. We always like hearing new takes on sci-fi dinosaur adventures. Oh, yeah. It was a really enjoyable read. And in just a moment, we'll get into our dinosaur of the day, Magnapolia. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Magnapolia, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a Lambiosaurian hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Baja California, Mexico, in the El Gallo Formation. It was a very large hadrosaur with a crest on top of its head and a bulky body, walked on four legs, and it had a tall tail. Love those Lambiosaurians. <laughs> Thinking of Parasaurolophus. Originally, it was estimated to be between 49 to 54 feet oh. or 15 to 16 and a half meters long and weigh up to 8.8 tons. Holy moly, that's a big dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> much bigger than that new ankylosaur. Yeah, much bigger than I think any hadrosaur ever. Although you said originally. Well, in 2012, Albert Prieto Marquez and others estimated it to be around 41 feet or 12 and a half meters long. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Tiny little thing. <laughs> that's still, still huge. That's, I think, like Edmontosaurus type size. That's very, very big. Yes, it is. Except it's a Lambiosaurine too. So it had the, like you said, the big head crest. That's super cool. Yeah, it was, it's been described as a giant hadrosaurid. The type species is Magnapolia laticatus. It was described in 1981 by William Morris. Originally, Morris referred the fossils to Hippacrosaurus altispinus, based on the long neural spines of the tail, but then he changed it to 
CF lambiosaurus that's based on details of the premaxilla, the upper jaw, and then he named it Lambiosaurus laticatus based on its large size and the tall neural spines in the tail. Later scientists suggested Lambiosaurus laticatus could be Hippacrosaurus or not a valid taxon. Magnapalia was named by Albert Prieto Marquez, Chiapi, and Joshi as Magnapalia in 2012. I'm not surprised that Albert Prieto Marquez was part of it because he is the hadrosaur expert, as we've come to know. <laughs> and an unapologetic splitter. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the genus name means large, and polia, the polia part, is in honor of, quote, Mr. Paul Haga for his outstanding support to the research and public programs of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and its Dinosaur Institute, end quote. And the species name means broad tail. The fossils were found in an excavation by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County between 1968 and 1974. The holotype includes parts of the jaw, vertebrae, parts of the leg, parts of the pelvis, and parts of the arm. Well, that's pretty good. So you've got head all the way through hips here and there and legs. So for a 40-foot long dinosaur, that's a, quite a bit of bones to get out. You can see why it took him six years. There are also 24 referred specimens <laughs> found. Jeez. Oh, Oh, they were all within three meters of where the holotype was found. Okay, so those aren't 24 individuals. There's multiple bones from same individuals, probably, if it's within three meters. Well, the fossils found include partial skeletons and skin impressions. Ooh. Morris thought that Lambiosaurus laticatus, now Magnapalia, spent its time in the water because it was so big and it had such a tall, narrow tail that... Maybe that was good for swimming because it could give itself a push. We're going back to that, huh? Yeah. He also talked about weak connections in the hips, and there was a healed broken thigh bone that he thought would have been too difficult of an injury to survive on land. You know, it's easier to recover in water because you have less weight on the leg. <laughs> I was going into like a therapy pool. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of surprising for 1981 to be talking about the dinosaurs too heavy to be on land because that was, I think, pretty well debunked by that point. Mm. I think part of it, though, was the unusual tail. Yeah, that's true. I mean, people are even now talking about that with Spinosaurus. So. Mm -hmm. Now, Prieto Marquez and others said that adult hadrosaurids were between 7 to 10 meters long, and Magnapolia was much longer. Quote, one of the largest known hadrosaurid species, not only in North America, but in the world, end quote. And that's what makes it a giant hadrosaurid. That's the truth. It is a huge hadrosaur. Yeah. And Chappie wrote on his site that, quote, the size was so impressive that it could have been mistaken for an apatosaurus, end quote. <laughs> wow. <laughs> At least a, you know, not not a maximum sized apatosaurus, but, you know, a moderately sized or juvenile apatosaurus for sure. Something much bigger than you'd think a hadrosaur would be. Yeah. Magnapolia had a proportionately slender femur. Only fragments of the crest had been found. It had elongated chevrons and vertebral spines similar to Hippacrosaurus, which meant that it had a tall tail. The tail of one specimen that's been found had skin impressions with large scales up to four centimeters wide that were surrounded by one centimeter wide hexagonal and rounded scales. And in freedom units, that's what, two inches for the big ones and half an inch for the little ones? <laughs> Sounds about right. Do you like my use of freedom units? That caught me off guard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a joke because they're more difficult to use than metric. Ah, I see. That was a interesting choice of words there. Anyway, <laughs> Magnapolia is closely related to Velifrons, which was also found in what is now Mexico, and we covered Velifrons back in episode 324. Other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Magnapolia include Dromaeosaurs, Tyrannosaurs, Hadrosaurs, and Ankylosaurs. And other animals that lived around the same time and place include Lepidosaurs, mammals, and amphibians. And our fun fact of the day is that Ankylosaurs, like Patagopelta, made it from North America to South America across something similar to Panama during what is called the First American Biotic Interchange. Hmm. It's called the First American Biotic Interchange because there's another famous swap of animals between North and South America, which is called the Great 
American interchange. Interesting. I guess they didn't want to totally steal the thunder of the Great American Interchange by calling it the first Great American Interchange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they went with a totally different American Biotic Interchange. I think th they also want to turn it into an acronym of FABI, F-A-B-I, for, you know, so you don't have to say out first uh, American Biotic Interchange every time. Interesting. Yeah. The Great American Interchange will undoubtedly be a topic of our new I Know Paleo series for our ad-free patrons because it is so interesting and it involves <laughs> dinosaurs in a really cool way because in short, what happened is when Panama connected the Americas a few million years ago, all the weird stuff like armadillos, terror birds, which are dinosaurs, and sloths that evolved in isolation in South America were suddenly connected to animals that evolved from all over the rest of the world, mm -hmm. like cats and dogs and uh -oh. Or I should say wolves and all sorts of other stuff. So those animals went down into South America and, you know, things like terror birds came up into North America and armadillos. We still have them up here. And just chaos ensued in general. It was a really interesting time in paleontology. But the first American biotic interchange or FIBA or FABI is much more poorly known since it is so much farther back in time. It's on the order of 50 times longer ago hmm. in history and really once you the farther back you go things rapidly become harder to tell mm -hmm. things that are like 10 to twenty thousand years ago in history we have a super good idea about how the what was going on then you go a million years ago and it's like eh, we kind of know 100 million years ago we barely know it's really putting together small puzzle pieces at that point we know that north and south america were connected during pangea and that was you know beginning of the triassic and we also know that they started separating, specifically South America started separating from Africa in the late Jurassic. Mm -hmm. And then at some point in the Cretaceous, they were fully separated, South America and Africa. And also at some points, South America was completely isolated from everything. But the connection to North America is pretty messy because depending on sea level, Central America was either a shallow sea or a land bridge. <laughs> hmm. And it's pretty shallow, so it gets complicated. And it's further complicated by the fact that there were active volcanoes both in Central America, but also in what is now the Caribbean islands, Ooh. which were moving around. And actually, the Caribbean islands were kind of closer to where Central America is in terms of the connection point between North and South America. And the height of those volcanoes is kind of hard to know because it changes pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, you know, 100 million years ago. That's very complicated. Yeah. So it's really hard to know exactly when these ankylosaurs made it down. Although I did mention that it looks like this new ankylosaur that was found was from more closely related to the mid-Cretaceous stuff. So that can help be a puzzle piece by doing these phylogenetic studies. According to an article by Vignola Lopez published last year, Central Cuba has a late Cretaceous pterosaur and some plants that show direct evidence of the FABI. And about 70 to 80 million years ago, Cuba was basically in a position like Panama is today, connecting North and South America. Hmm. Which is crazy to me because Cuba is nowhere near a connection between North and South America at this point. It's like 90 degrees rotated from being useful <laughs> as a connection mm -hmm. and way off east far, far away from where a, a useful connection would happen. Earth is always changing. It is. And yeah, especially over the period of 70 to 80 million years. There's also good evidence that an interchange was happening from phylogenetics, not only from ankylosaurs, but we also have hadrosaurs, mammals, land snails, and plants, where you can see these connections between the families in North and South America and families that were established in North America showing up in South America there's also one example of animals going from South America to North America, and that is titanosaurs. Hmm. We can see that the North American titanosaurs in the late Cretaceous are related to the South American ones, which seem to be their ancestors. So it wasn't just a one-way thing. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, too, that it's similar to the Great American Interchange that happened a couple million years ago, where there was a lot more going north to south yeah. than going south to north. They wanted the warmer weather? <laughs> I think it's more that the North one was more connected to other things. Uh, so it's sort of like the rest of the world versus South America in terms of what was going where. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, yeah, the FABI, as I like to call it, 
was a dinosaur version of the more recent Great American Interchange. And I wonder just how surprised those dinosaurs were to see brand new animals showing up one day that had never been in their ecosystem before. That must have just been crazy. Chaos ensued. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. If you want even more dinosaur goodness, consider joining our newsletter. You can sign up at inodino.com. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be talking about dinosaur eggs, among other news. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.